This video will explain a large-scale AutoML experiment from researchers at Google and DeepMind. The common practice in training deep neural networks is to interleave convolutional layers with batch normalizations followed by a ReLU activation. This study parameterizes the space of normalization activation layers and finds the EVO norm B0 and S0 layers. A ResNet 50 with batch norm ReLU achieves 76.1% ImageNet accuracy, whereas using the new custom EVO norm layer achieves 77.8% accuracy. The authors don't just test this on ResNet 50s, integrating the layer with MobileNet v2 and efficient net models as well to avoid overfitting to a single architecture when discovering this new normalization activation layer. This video will explain the design space the researchers come up with for tensor in, tensor out, normalization activation layers, and how they use evolutionary search and multi-objective optimization to discover this new layer. This video will explain the latest large-scale AutoML experiment from researchers at Google and DeepMind. This experiment constructs a design space of unified normalization and activation layers and uses evolution to search through it. The experiments show that the discovered layer EVO norms B0 and S0 work better than the common practice of batch normalization followed by a ReLU activation. Batch normalization followed by a ReLU activation is one of the most common computational blocks put into these deep neural networks, and particularly these deep convolutional neural networks used for tasks like image classification, the training of generative adversarial networks, object detection, or segmentation. So what happens in batch normalization is you take the, you have a set of images that you've passed through that form the batch. So within each of these deep convolutional networks, they have these intermediate tensors, which are the feature representations at some intermediate layer of the neural network. So what you're going to do is you're going to sum up the uh, different activations of these features of an intermediate layer across the entire batch. So say you have 16 images in a batch that are all going through to be classified by this deep convolutional neural network. You're going to sum up the feature activations across, say, the width or the height or the channel axis to get these uh, feature map activations. And then you're going to normalize the features in a given uh, you know, image by subtracting it by the mean of the batch and then dividing it by the standard deviation of these activations across the entire image batch going through this convolutional neural network. So then what we're gonna do is multiply it by gamma and beta learned parameters to scale and shift the activations in each of these, uh, you know, in each of these tensors throughout these deep convolutional neural network. So then you take this, the, the output of the batch normalization and pass it through this ReLU activation function. So this kind of pipeline of batch norm followed by ReLU is a common practice in deep convolutional neural networks. This paper is gonna explore a way to automatically search for a better construction of this kind of layer for the training of these deep neural networks and performance gains and uh, inference speed. A somewhat similar study in AutoML was searching for activations, the product of which is the swish activation function. This case is searching for a scalar in, scalar out activation. So as in the ReLU activation function, if you have a value like minus eight, you would set that to zero. And if you have something like say eight, you'd keep that at eight. So what they're doing in searching for activation functions is they're using a reinforced and learning search to find different unary operations like taking the absolute value or you know squaring the number and then binary functions which is where you're combining it like addition or subtraction and they're using this to parameterize a search space to find an activation function this study evolving normalization activation layers is looking at a much more general layer tensor in tensor out rather than just scalar in scalar out on a separate note, normalization layers have been really interesting, and we haven't seen a lot of AutoML studies that are looking at designing these normalization layers. One case of this is in recent papers from NVIDIA, like StyleGAN2 or Spatially Adaptive Incidence Normalization, which is used for that GAU-GAN uh, pixel maps to photorealistic landscape images. They use these normalization layers in order to control the intermediate feature maps and render these uh, images. This image is an overview of the normalization activation design space. We have the input tensor X, then we have learnable parameters V0 and V1, and then a constant tensor zero with zeros. So what we're doing is we're trying to find different operations to plug and route these different intermediate tensors to form an output tensor that has the same dimension as the input tensor. So the evolutionary search is going to be looking for different uh, operations, choosing from this manually defined set of primitives, like taking the square root, of the uh, you know the standard deviation along this axis of the tensor as in sort of like a batch normalization operation and then doing things like adding them or dividing them or doing like a max operation so it's going to search through a set of primitive operations to connect the input tensor learnable parameters and a constant tensor as well this table shows a set of all the primitive operations that the evolutionary search can choose from to construct these normalization activation layers with the arity describing the number of inputs to the function so for example, you have two inputs for this division function, whereas you just have one input or one, uh, the arity 
for something like doing this uh, batch mean or uh, you know channel mean or these different ways of indexing the tensors and then aggregating statistics from these indexing of the tensor because you have this tensor that's like this four dimensional thing of batch uh, width, height, channel. So you have these different operations that are used in normalization layers to you know, normalize the features based on one of these uh, indexed axes. Hopefully this slide can help clarify this idea of indexing the tensors and then aggregating statistics by indexing these tensors. So what you have is you have these uh, tensors that are the intermediate feature maps in these deep convolutional neural networks as they're processing a batch of images. So if you're just processing say one image, the tensor of that would be uh, one by the height, by the width, by the number of channels, which is the number of filters in the uh, convolutional layer of this intermediate tensor. So when you do something like indexing the tensor, you have the batch where say you just pass n images uh, through these deep convolutional neural networks and you would index them along the different batches to compute, to aggregate the statistics that are used for these different aggregation operations. It's also worth noting that the authors are gonna search for two different normalization activation layers based on whether they can use batch statistics where you're aggregating across the whole batch. So say you're using the 16 images that are each going through deep convolutional neural networks, or if you're just using one image through the convolutional network at a time. And there's a lot of different stuff related to how uh, aggregating batch statistics affects the training, the things like needing larger batch sizes and all sorts of miscellaneous other training dynamics that can be associated with the two different ways of structuring the normalization layers, whether it's across the whole batch or just within a single image's intermediate features. There are some interesting connections between this study, Evolving Normalization Activation Layers, and another recent study, AutoML0. AutoML0 is also searching through these low-level primitives and one of the key uh, relations between these two papers is that they have sparse, meaningful phenotypes, which means that most of these uh, rendered normalization activation layers and most of these programs that are searched for in AutoML0 are completely nonsense, they're not useful at all. So that's an interesting connection between AutoML0 and then this search space for these normalization activation layers, where you can imagine a lot of these uh, operations are really horrible normalization layers compared to the batch norm ReLU pipeline. Now that we've seen how the authors are designing this design space with these different primitives and different ways of connecting the input with learned parameters and constant tensors, we'll talk about how they use their evolutionary search to search through these different potential uh, normalization layers. So some of the interesting details is that each search takes two days to complete with 5,000 CPU workers. A single CPU worker with two cores takes between three to 10 hours to train the networks with the layers on the CFAR10 proxy task which is used to quickly evaluate the network before scaling it up to something like image net classification. And they also tested on object detection, segmentation, and the big GAN model. So they also throw out models after 100 steps that have less than 20% validation accuracy, as in that connection with AutoML0, where most of these rendered normalization layers are really awful normalization layers. And so we add in that check of after 100 steps, check if it has less than 20% validation accuracy. And if it is in that case, then just throw it out and stop, don't train it further. So they're gonna also evaluate this on K models. So they're gonna test this on ResNet models, uh, mobile nets, and efficient nets to make sure that this layer uh, generalizes outside of a particular architecture. One of the core workhorses behind these evolutionary search algorithms is how they're gonna mutate the genotypes to render new phenotypes, in this case, different normalization activation layers. So what they're gonna do is select an intermediate node uniformly at random. So say selecting this uh, square root along this width batch channel axis, and then replacing its current operation with a new one from that table of the different uh, primitives uniformly at random. So these all have the same probability of being selected and then replaced in the operation with the mutation. And they also select new predecessors for the node uniformly at random. So randomly picking a new input from this uh, node you selected to say, instead of indexing this intermediate tensor and applying this, you would index this one or this one or this one. Something like that is how you mutate these uh, genotypes that code these normalization activation layers and then change them such that you can design better ones that have a better fitness function and go through this loop of evolutionary search. Another interesting characteristic of their evolutionary search algorithm is the Pareto selection for multi-objective optimization. So in this case, the multi-objective is describing its performance when this layer is put into different models. So say you take this layer and put it in a ResNet 50 would be model one, a MobileNet V2 would be model two, and then efficient net would be model three. So this idea of the Pareto selection is instead of selecting the model uh, B with the best average performance, you're gonna randomly select one that's kind of along the, you know, the, the outside of this. So kind of like a PPF curve in economics, kind of this like, you know, the models that are on the edge of this curve is the idea of this Pareto selection for choosing which uh, model is gonna then be mutated to form more uh, models in the evolutionary search. 
To further describe this concept, they're going to ensure that the layer that's discovered in this large-scale evolutionary search generalizes to multiple architectures. You don't want to find a normalization activation layer that only works for ResNet 50, only works for a mobile net uh, v2, or so on. So what they're doing is they have this multi-objective optimization, which you grab this uh, layer from the genotype and then you render it into these different models, and that's how you get this multi-objective optimization task. From their design space, they randomly sample different normalization activation layers that can possibly be discovered in this design space. And you see the distribution of accuracy and the number of samples with these different activation normalization activation layers put into either a ResNet 50, a MobileNet v2, or an efficient net. So this correlation between the performance of different layers on ResNet 50 and MobileNet v2, or efficient net and MobileNet v2, show that there is kind of no free lunch with this. And it's not really like there's this one normalization activation layer that always performs the best in you know, all of the different architectures. You are gonna be able to probably tweak it to perform better on efficient net than it will on mobile net v2 or something like that. The products of this search are the Evo norm B0 and S0. Again, the difference between these two normalization activation layers is based on whether they use batch statistics or whether it's just about one image's activations through the deep convolutional neural network. So they provide these implementations in TensorFlow all you need to do is you know, just add this block. If it's something like uh, Keras, like model.add, and then use this custom function that they provide in the appendix A of the paper. So also, as we talked about previously with the no free lunch, if you're not using one of these uh, ResNet 50 mobile net v2 or efficient net, and you have a more custom architecture, you might wanna try an appendix B of their paper. They have 10 different variants of each of these uh, normalization activation layers. So you might wanna tweak it a little bit to see if you can get you know, a little bit extra performance with your custom architecture. These are the results of applying the Evo norm B0, B1, B2 layers on ImageNet classification. So you see with the batch normalization ReLU on a ResNet 50, you get 76.1% accuracy. Using the Swish activation, which is the product of that, uh, searching for activation functions, using reinforcement learning search to find the Swish activation, scalar in, scalar out, similar kind of way of having this primitive set of operations and then plugging it into this manually defined uh, design space. So you see that you get uh, 77.2 when you use the batch norm followed by swish. But then when you use this evo norm layer, you get 77.8. So compared to the common practice of batch norm ReLU, where you get 76.1% accuracy with the ResNet 50, you get 77.8% on using this custom layer. So in some applications, this kind of gain in accuracy is really important. So you also see gains in MobileNet v2, the uh, neural architecture search network, but you don't see much gains in efficient net b5. And one reasoning for this is that efficient net B5 is also the product of this neural architecture search that is customizing the scaling up of uh, input resolution, the width of the network, and the depth of the network. And it's optimized directly for these batch norm ReLU activations. So that's one interesting detail that kind of skews the results of comparing Evo norm with the scaled up variants of efficient net. I highly recommend checking out the paper to get more details about the results of their studies, looking at how this scales up with respect to these EvoNorm layers that use batch statistics and then how many different images you put into the batch, then testing this model on uh, object detection with the mask RCNN model, uh, also testing it with uh, different uh, big GAN models and the segmentation models. So what they show with the big GAN results is that they don't get much better performance in the batch norm ReLU, but it's kind of interesting because it's not searched for on the big GAN task they find the layer on image classification and then just try to bring it over to the big GAN model as well. But it looks like, you know, in the inception score automated metric of judging these uh, big GAN generated images, they don't perform better, although they do perform better in this FID metric. But either way, it's not by so much that you would say that, you know, this Evo norm layer is now the best practice for uh, big GANs. Another interesting experiment they run is comparing their evolutionary search to random search in this design space, where you see that the evolutionary search significantly outperforms the random searches shown in green. So the random search idea is interesting with respect to thinking about the design space itself or this, you know, this kind of parameterization of all the different uh, layers that can emerge from the search. So uh, another paper that came out recently from researchers at Facebook is designing network design spaces as looking at you know, trying to design a design space that a random search would perform well. So I also thought this chart was interesting, relating it back to that with respect to looking at the, you know, the way that they're parameterizing the primitive operations, the connections between input, learn parameters, and cons and tensors, as well as the actual search algorithm itself. Thanks for watching this overview of evolving normalization activation layers. Another really interesting study on AutoML to design custom layers and custom deep neural network models that are achieving better performance than manually designed layers. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Thank you.